Hairy cell leukemia is a rare chronic B cell leukemia that accounts for 2% of all leukemias with approximately 1,200 new cases reported in the United States each year. Major advances in the treatment and understanding of the biology and the genomic landscape have been made, which have increased median survival. In this OncoLife peer exchange panel discussion, we will be discussing diagnosis, prognosis, and current and new treatment options to shed light on how the most recent data will be used to shape the way we treat our patients. I am Dr. Robert J. Kreitman. I work at the NIH in Bethesda, Maryland. Today, I am joined by my colleague, Dr. Farhad Ravandi, uh, the uh, Janice and Stefan A. Lasher Professor of Medicine and Chief of the Section of Developmental Therapeutics in the Department of Leukemia at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's begin. So let's start by talking about the first line, or what we call upfront therapy, in hairy cell leukemia. Uh, first, uh, let's uh, talk about the recent updates to the NCCN guidelines. Um, the NCCN guidelines is uh, a group of uh, experts uh, who uh, uh, report on what is the important uh, changes that are uh, in the management of patients with hairy cell leukemia. Um, they continue to consider uh, pure nucleoside analogs as the first line of therapy. Uh, but uh, there are now some uh, considerations for uh, second and subsequent line of therapy, and I don't know if you would like to expand on that. Well, we'll, uh, we'll talk about a, a new drug that uh, was approved for hairy cell leukemia, moxitumumab pseudotox. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and there's also uh, some BRAF inhibitors uh, that have been uh, tested. Uh, not exactly approved uh, for hairy cell leukemia, although many people are getting them. Uh, so we'll also also touch on those uh, subjects. In regards to uh, the decision to initiate therapy in a patient with hairy cell leukemia, uh, the NCCN guidelines, as well as all, all the other guidelines, including the ones recommended by the um, Hairy Cell Leukemia Foundation uh, group, uh, only consider initiation of therapy if the patient is symptomatic. Uh, that means they have constitutional symptoms, weight loss, uh, fever, uh, significant fatigue, or there is evidence of bone marrow failure with reduction in uh, the blood counts, including uh, platelet counts below about 100,000, hemoglobin below 11, and uh, neutrophil count below uh, thousand. Um, I don't think there has been any change in that in terms of NCCN guidelines. Right. Some people use uh, 10 instead of 11 for the hemoglobin, so there's a little bit of variability, but that's how it's been for many, many years. And uh, uh, I would add that uh, the reason for that is you don't want to be throwing in chemotherapy for a patient who has good blood counts uh, because that patient could uh, be watch and waited. Uh, we use that to say that we can wait on treatment. And how often would you follow patients uh, what, who are being watched and waited? Uh, it really depends on uh, the degree of symptoms uh, and the degree of the decline in the blood counts. Uh, so, for example, um, if a patient has a platelet count of 99, I don't follow them weekly to uh, make sure it doesn't drop dramatically because the decline in these counts in most patients will be gradual. However, um, if a patient uh, is becoming symptomatic, uh, I will start thinking about making the decision to treat the patient. Now, it's very important to remember that uh, fatigue per se can be a coexisting symptom from other conditions. So you clearly want to make sure uh, that the symptoms that the patient uh, is attributing to the hairy cell are truly related to the hairy cell leukemia. Uh, but in general, I, uh, in a uh, asymptomatic patient with mild decline in the blood counts, I probably would see them every two to three months. Uh, 
and uh, if the symptoms start progressing significantly, I probably see them more frequently. So one important question is if you have a patient who it has a, is having infections and that's the reason they need treatment, um, do you want to jump in right away with these chemotherapy drugs in such a patient? Well, it's important to remember that uh, the standard, uh, the most commonly used standard therapy, cladribine, is itself uh, myelosuppressive and will produce a period of about a month of uh, significant uh, neutropenia and uh, uh, probably a, a decline in the immune function of the patient for several months thereafter. Uh, so um, uh, uh, the, the recurrent infections is an important consideration for therapy but I, in my practice, I make sure that the patients are uh, well educated about neutropenia and neutropenic fever. And I tend to use prophylactic antibiotics. This is not uh, a standard and not used by everyone, but I tend to use um, an antiviral uh, prophylaxis with uh, the valacyclovir and also an antibacterial prophylaxis with uh, um, uh, levofloxacin. Um, so, um, uh, yes, it is very important to remember that initiation of therapy with cladribine will actually predispose the patients more to infections. Right. So it sounds like you don't use uh, anything to prevent pneumocystis, and we also do not, uh, uh, we're not so, also not concerned about pneumocystis, particularly in patients who are not on steroids and only getting treated for the first time. Yes. Uh, again, some uh, groups or some uh, uh, experts do use uh, uh, Bactrim, but I don't use it because um, in a straightforward, uncomplicated hairy cell leukemia, I have yet to see a patient who develops uh, pneumocystis uh, infection.